Uh, thank you, Johannes and Pascal, for, for joining. And you guys work on dendritic computations and, and AI, which is right up our alley. So we're really excited to have you guys talk, and um, I'll let you go ahead with that. Okay, great. So I will share my screen. Um, Pascal and I will switch at some point during the talk. Yeah, so first of all, thanks a lot for having us. And thanks to Vivian for establishing this connection. Uh, nice to get in touch. Um, and what we want to talk about today is a topic that I think has been with us, um, with Pascal and me, I think for the last three years, more or less, by now. Um, so it started when we were both in uh, Osnabrück University. And I have since moved to Bonhoeffer Institute uh, for Integrated Circuits in the south of Germany. But um, yeah, the topic is very interesting. So we are still working on this uh, three years later. And um, so we prepared the slides to take um, roughly half an hour. So there should be plenty of time for you to interrupt, ask questions, however you want. Uh, my understanding is that you like to have these meetings rather interactive. So uh, uh, derail us at any time you like. And um, yeah. And I would like to start um, by talking a bit about the problem that we are trying to solve. And the problem is sequence detection. And to give a very simple example of what that, what that might be is, um, uh, imagine I say something like Panama. And these are three very brief phonemes. Uh, and together they make up a word. And what's really important for understanding the word is the order in which these three syllables are said, or these three phonemes. The precise timing, however, matters less probably. Yeah? There, there might be deviations between different speakers. And also I personally, when I say the same word three times, I might um, have slightly different timings between all of these. But um, still we can reliably detect these. And it seems to be a very general thing that, um, well, animals and humans uh, as animals, we, we are able to do. And it's, it's not just the thing with um, auditory processing. The, the same sort of problem also happens when you look at navigation tasks. So um, if you think about the environment of an animal um, that is tiled by play cell populations, if an animal moves through this environment, it also will sequentially activate different populations of these play cells. And that will lead to a very distinct pattern of activation over time that um, will encode in the order in which these are activated, it will decode the path that this animal took. So in, in more abstract terms, like we have some event A, and in order for it to form a sequence that we might be interested in, yeah, this event A has to be followed within some time frame. And this time frame uh, for a lot of behavioral tasks might be on the order of 100 milliseconds or, or even more than this. Yeah, this. This event A has to be followed by a second event B. And only if the second event followed the first event in the time frame, then we detected a subsequence of the sequence that we're interested in. And that starts another time frame. Yeah? And now we are looking for the next event that might um, occur, but it has to occur in this time frame. So in this case, imagine the third, third event, in this case, the third uh, phoneme, for example, or the third receptive field that we entered here. Uh, that has to happen in the time frame given by the second uh, event that has happened. And only if all three of them happen in the right succession, we would say it was the full sequence ABC that we're looking at. Yeah, and from a computer science perspective, this is a, this is a solvable problem that, um, for example, a finite state automaton could solve. So imagine we have some initial state, it's a starting state, uh, and then there is some event that happens, this event A, uh, and then this will turn the finite state automaton into another uh, state, into a waiting state where it's now waiting for the input B. And if nothing happens, then after some time, uh, this uh, finite state machine is going to time out and it's going to revert back to the initial state because nothing happened, it just uh, randomly someone said pa, but it's, uh, it's not the full sequence that we're looking for. But while we are in this waiting state, if now the next event happens, this B event, then we go into the next waiting state. And now if we finally hear the event C, yeah, then we had the complete sequence. And at this point, the sequence detector would then fire, would say, okay, we detected the sequence ABC. Um, and, and that's what we're after, right? And then it would fire and revert back to the initial state. So, so this sort of problem um, is, I think, a fairly simple problem. Um, so we want to be able to detect sequences of distinct events, and these events have to occur in the correct order. 
but we don't care that much about the specific timing. In fact, we, we want to be invariant with respect to the timing because it would be a pain if we had to train a different pattern detector for basically each of these slight variations in the same sequence. And the time scales that are relevant um, might be behavioral time scales in the order of 100 milliseconds, a um, couple of hundred milliseconds, maybe even seconds in the end. So this is a problem that we got interested in. And um, so we looked into the literature for quite some time to, to figure out how this had been discussed before. And we found there's a lot of research uh, on this problem in general, because it occurs in many different contexts. So one of the most obvious things is um, in audio processing or language understanding, there are these different time scales in which we need to integrate information. So for example, we need to be able to detect these quick events, these phonemes that someone said like pa, and this can be really fast, like 50 milliseconds or less. But then on a slower time scale, we need to be able to integrate that information to make up something like Panama, like the, the longer um, sequence. And um, uh, that, for example, can happen on a time scale of 200 milliseconds or more. And uh, so this is um, not just something that uh, we can do, like see in psychophysics experiments, but you can also look really in biology directly and do measurements. And there is some cor um, uh, th there is some biological activity that corresponds to this. There are some some correlates to, to this activity on the same time scales. It suggests that yeah, th there really seem to be biological mechanisms operating on these different time scales. And uh, if you do psychophysics experiments with people, trying to tease apart what is and isn't important for people to be able to detect these uh, sequences, these um, patterns, these words, it turns out that yes, as, as we might expect, the, the order in which these events occur is very important for perception. So uh, that, that is a convincing story for us that for, for audio processing, like these the sequences occur, but it's not limited to that. Like a very similar problem also occurs in, uh, in the hippocampus with play cells and navigation. And um, that's the, as I teased with this little picture of the mouse there. Um, so uh, people have measured um, sequences that are very distinct sequences of activity in play cells on the time scale of 100 milliseconds to five seconds. And these sequences can also re, uh, can be repeated in awake state, but particularly in sleeping state, um, when these um, sequences are replayed, or sometimes there's also preplay. And this can happen up to a factor of 20, fa 20 times faster than in, uh, when the animal is actively moving around. And now if we want to have a mechanism that can detect these sequences, both on the time scale that the animal is normally exploring the environment and on the much faster time scale during uh, pre-play or replay, then there has to be some mechanism that is to some degree timing invariant. And uh, people have studied this and uh, studied different modalities. And it seems that uh, this is kind of like a seems uh, um, recent evidence uh, converging that the hippocampus might not just be involved in the sort of task for navigation, but also for other modalities. And that it might actually be a bit more of a general principle that there is like sequence processing or processing of sequential information happening there. And um, I like the summary uh, here from for the role that this, these sequences play for, for processing in the, in the hippocampus. So yeah, they say the neural sequences play a key role in information processing and support the formation of initial memory traces. So, for the hippocampus, as well as for audio processing, these sequences seem to be quite important. And there's a lot of other examples. I mean, I don't want to go through all of them. I and mean, this slide is already like a lot of uh, like in your face, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, references. But it's, there's also um, similar results for olfaction, because in olfaction, there's very distinct patterns of activity um, that can be observed there uh, in vision as well. And also in general cognitive tasks, there is um, tasks where people need to process and sequential information. And it, so it, it is a recurring theme that we found everywhere. And so the question was, what are really the biological mechanisms to do all of this? And uh, what we found most compelling is when we, when we looked at more recent literature, are the results uh, about um, active dendritic processes that are happening. And so, Maybe starting from the basics, um, there's a lot of evidence that there that dendrites are not just these um, points that integrate 
information in a linear way, but in fact, the complex structures that they have is compartmentalized and lots of small compartments. Each of these compartments is capable of producing, of actively producing localized events. And uh, these events, in our view, they, they should play a major role in this sort of processing. And some of these events uh, can be rather long. So there's relatively short events and MDA spikes, but there can also be longer events, like um, as we would then call plateau potentials, that can last 100 milliseconds or more. And for us, this was a hint that maybe they play an important role in the sequential processing on behavioral time scales. Um, and what's interesting is that these dendritic events, I think, uh, they are much more critical or they seem to play a much more central role for information processing than one might have thought some years ago, because it turns out that um, there are many more of these actively generated events than there are somatic spikes. So uh, these uh, plateau potentials, for example, and digitic spikes, they occur very, very frequently. And it seems yeah, that if they if they have if they are so prevalent that they would play an important role in the processing of information. Um, now, if we assume that the dendrite segments are now mutually coupled together and they produce these active events, then of course these interactions between them have to um, they have to influence each other. So it's most likely not a linear system, but there have to be some interesting interactions between these different parts. And uh, the inputs that they receive are also not random, but it seems that these dendrite segments receive semantically clustered inputs um, that are from the same source populations or at least correlated inputs. And, and this is the last point I want to mention, that these, these active dendrites have been shown to be critical for many, many different tasks. So um, disabling these active processes can disrupt a lot of um, behaviors and it can also disrupt learning and other fundamental properties of, um, of these uh, neural networks. So in short, this evidence, yeah, all, of these, um, um, all of this research for us implies that uh, th there is a lot of support that, that first of all, the sequence processing, this detection of sequences is a really important problem that needs to be solved. And biology with these active dendrites might have the tools that we need to actually address this. And so um, I would now like to go back to the simple problem and look at like what, what are different ways how we could solve that. And I want to start with um, probably the most obvious way how one could address the sequence detection. And that is to look at neuron populations. So imagine this event A here uh, just triggers on some population of recurrently connected neurons um, A. Yeah. And this population can just turn on for some period of time. So it basically just implements the first part of this um, finite state automaton that I showed in the beginning. And if we now have a second population of neurons that receives input from this first one, then we can set it up such that uh, just input from the first population here is not enough to make this uh, population turn on. But if we additionally get the input that we are waiting for, that would be enough to turn this recurrent population on. Then it will stay on for some period of time. And we can repeat this game now by adding another neuron. This neuron is now waiting for input from this population as well as this external input. And only when it receives both of them, the neuron will fire. So this way we build now a kind of recurrence left feed forward network here that would be able to solve the task. And um, we, of course, we could simplify this. We could just say as just a recurrent network that could be able to solve it. And we could also train a network like this. Yeah? And it would be able to solve the task. It would also be able to deal with timing variations in principle. But the problem with this approach is that while it, it can solve the task, it also seems to require a kind of excessive number of neurons for this. Like that would mean that in order to detect like one word, we would need a population of neurons to, to just deal with this one thing. And then for different sequences, we would need different populations. And that, that seems a bit too much. And so we were convinced there has to be a simpler uh, approach. And so we were more interested in like single neuron solutions. And th there is a very classical theory how a single neuron could solve a task like this, which goes back to uh, Wilfried Dahl's um, ball and stick uh, neuron model. And the idea here is just 
you have the event um, A, but instead of directly um, connecting to the, to the SOMA, you have some connection that goes through some long synaptic transmission delay, and then there's potentially slow dynamics in the stand right. And the consequence of that is that the input um, doesn't directly arrive at the SOMA, but it only arrives with some delay. And if we can tune this delay, we can make it such that the delay from the first input is chosen exactly so that the second input, which reaches the SOMA through a different delay, arrives at the same time as the first input. And if we do this for all of the inputs in the sequence, we, we can tune it so that for all of these different inputs, they will all arrive at the SOMA at exactly the same time. And then the neuron only needs to be some coincidence detector to see, okay, like we, we, we got these three inputs here at the right times, so we detected the sequence. But this also has a problem. Right, so, so this sort of solution would mean you can detect one very specific sequence, but suddenly the timing invariance is gone. So if we shift one of these events around, uh, this neuron would no longer detect it because the timing is intimately tied to the transmission delays. And the second problem is that the transmission delays that you find in biology, like how long an axonal transmission delay actually can be is on the order of a couple of milliseconds at most, and the dendrites are also not uh, the, as slow as we would like. So uh, a sequence that is 200 milliseconds long would be very difficult to build with a neuron like this. So passive dendrite dynamics uh, and the transmission delays, while in, in theory they could work, to us they didn't seem like a very convincing solution for, for that sort of problem. And that's why, and this is now after a long uh, uh, excursion, we kind of we get to the, the point that we are most interested in, and that is the active dendritic processing. And I think a simple solution to this problem using active dendrites looks like this. So now instead of just having this ball and stick neuron, we would say the neuron has its different compartments, and each of these compartments can now act independently. And what happens now is that when some input A arrives, we now neglect the transmission delays um, for now because on the, on the time scale we're interested in their negligible. But uh, the input A can now turn this segment on for an extended period of time. So this, it would trigger a plateau potential in here. And this plateau potential is basically just a depolarization of the standard segment. But since the dendrite segments that are neighboring each other are electrically coupled, the um, higher membrane potential will not stay here. It will diffuse through the, through the neuron. And the way we model it is by just saying, OK, so if this dendrite segment is active, it will have a weakly depolarizing effect on the next segment. Um, so it will make this segment more likely to fire when it receives now synaptic input. And so that means that in this time window, if we now have the synaptic input, the synaptic input will trigger this uh, dendrite segment on. And we can play the same game again. Now, this dendrite segment is, of course, electrically coupled in both directions. And so it will depolarize now the SOMA a little bit, and it will fully depolarize the upstream dendrites. So there's some asymmetry in the um, production, but it's maybe not so, so interesting now. The interesting part, I think, is that if this dendrite segment now depolarizes the soma, then the soma becomes receptive to the next input um, C here. And uh, when this arrives, it could trigger a spike at the soma. But if this would arrive without any of these other inputs arriving prior um, to C, it, it would not be enough to make the neuron fire. Hey, Johannes, uh, I yep. have a quick, yeah, quick question. The common, yeah, I mean, the way the plateau potential stuff works that even the event A would depolarize the soma for several hundred milliseconds uh, up to 10 to 20 minutes. Like it doesn't need to go through, you don't need to have the depolarization at B, just A itself is enough to depolarize the soma. Mm, yeah, that's, I, I would say this is um, a matter of debate, I would say. So it depends where you depolarize the soma. Um, uh, so, uh, sorry, where, where you depolarize the dendrite. So our assumption was, if you look at um, the, so once you depolarize a part of the dendrite and you look at the passive, so now you're looking at the passive spread of the uh, membrane potential that comes from this one plateau potential. And uh, the, if you look at the um, 
how quickly this potential should decay if you go from uh, from this dendrites to, towards the soma. It shouldn't be that depolarizing anywhere in the distal dendrite is enough to have a significant effect on the soma. It should be like the effect should weaken over over the distance, right? And that's true for a, like a, a individual synapses in isolation, but when you get an active dendritic event, like a cluster of synapses firing, you do see a sustained depolarization of the soma. Well, because there's a, there's a dendritic spike, an NMDA spike, which will travel to the soma. Not actively, though. It does um, actively propagate. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's, not as, it's not as reliable as a, a sodium action potential, but um, it's pretty reliable. And there's well, some debate about that, um, but under many conditions, it does reach the soma. Yeah, the, the, you, you cited this um, Antic paper in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, so they talk about it, and also the newer work by his group also uh, shows this uh, pretty clearly. There, there's also some work, um, losing a little bit sight of all the uh, citations now, which group exactly it was, but they did exactly this uh, sort of 2019, it's an e-life paper, definitely. Um, how much uh, is each segment, uh, or how much are segments of a dendrite electrically coupled towards each other? And they um, sort of probe the dendrite in that way. And they do actually find a, quite a substantial um, compartmentalization depending on the neuron they use this on. I mean, this modeling work mostly. Yeah, um, but that, that makes sense, but, and I think we'd agree with that, but, yeah. but it, the whole point of that, that is um, sort of these passive um, electrical properties. Yeah. But, but an NMDA spike it transcends that. Um, and, and and actively travels along the dendrite and reaches the soma. Not again. There's some debate about an, under what conditions, but in many conditions that occurs. So again, it's whether you're talking about passive electrical properties or active propagation. Well, I, I guess I guess our reference points are is uh, um, there's I think it's a Sproston review or something. Uh, where there's specifically in there that um, plateaus are localized events, um, and you do find um, uh, measurements of calcium. So th this is this new sort of um, uh, two-photon microscopy where they um, image the calcium densities along the dendrite, and you can see the calcium on active dendritic events. This is one of the uh, papers uh, Johannes cited earlier. Um, they have different spatial sort of um, extent throughout the soma, but many of them do remain localized. So you have a localized increase in calcium. And the NMDA spike itself cannot actively propagate as long as there aren't glutamate bindings on the other NMDA spikes, right? So, so if the condition isn't met for NMDA spikes closer to the soma to activate with depolarization as well as glutamate binding, those won't open. And then if the calcium remains local, the dendritic plateau remains local. I guess um, the case where it propagates towards the soma um, is in, in all the stuff we'll talk about today is sort of the simple case. Um, our thought experiments from here on out sort of relies on the fact that you can compartmentalize these plateaus because a really kind of computation arises from that. Mm. If, if, you, if, if that's possible, let's, let's put it like that. Yep. There's also other studies that talk about like how the active processes can facilitate or can be facilitated by activity more downstream and so on. So it's like, uh, I think there's a, I would concede that there is a conflicting amount of evidence, I would say. So I, I don't think it's, I mean, okay, if you're saying that um, for you it's a conclusive thing that the dendritic um, spikes uh, will always um, depolarize the neuron uh, at the soma at the same way, then this is a different model, right? So, so in our model, as Pascal said, we, we do assume that the effect of that is locally generated will have, I mean, if it wasn't, um, if it would always spread all the way, it wouldn't be a localized effect. So we are thinking, we are assuming there is a localized effect somehow that then spreads passively because it requires two factors. It requires the depolarization and it requires some binding of synaptic inputs, some uh, neurotransmitter. Yeah, I think one of the um, areas to be careful about here is that if you look at the apical dendrites, those dendritic things do not travel to the soma unless there is a, a, a major calcium event. Um, but the basal dendritic segments those those um, 
there, when you have active dendritic events, they do travel to the soma um, for a sustained depolarization. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have to be careful which, which of those uh, uh, you're looking at as well. Yeah, I think we were only looking at apical. I mean, the, the thing is the mechanism that we are talking about here. So if you, if you uh, um, suspend disbelief for a moment and you just uh, think about how these coupled segments would interact, this, a similar mechanism would be possible in different places. So it might not even just be in pyramidal neurons. You also have similar, like actively generated events locally um, in other types of neurons as well. So it's, um, it's, it's more of a, like a, a general mechanism that we think plays an important role in um, apical dendrites, I would say, for basal dendrites. Um, yeah, it, it, it might be that they are too close to, uh, to the soma for, um, for them to even have this effect. That's true. But um, yeah, so I can... Um, yeah, go ahead, you go ahead. I, I can send you, a few I'll send you a couple of papers yeah. afterwards. You can, you can take a look. Yep. Yeah, certainly. That would be very interesting. Yeah. OK, then I will say for now, we just um, we continue as if uh, we all agreed uh, that there are these localized events, uh, right? And electrically coupled compartments where there is a neighborhood interaction that would happen also just through the passive spread of uh, membrane potential from, from one segment to the next, right? So if that, if that happens, um, then you would have a mechanism like this where you would actually need a couple of different events. So it would not be sufficient to just have. So um, in, this, um, in the um, view that, that you were saying now, where uh, any actively uh, generated event in the dendrites would have a depolarizing effect on the soma, then you can basically ignore this middle B. Here. Then you directly go from A to C. Then the sequences become a lot simpler. You basically just have the um, you have a plateau potential which induces an upstate in the stoma and makes the neuron receptive to a somatic input. Yeah, then, then we are looking at only sequences A, B, which is, I think, more similar to, to other models. I think it's also more similar to the HTM model. Um, and so I think this is where the connection then comes in. Um, for now, we will just uh, go all in on this. Um, uh, locally coupled dendrite segments. And uh, I, Johanna, think, Johanna, yeah. I might have misunderstood what you just said there. I didn't understand what you said there. So one of the things I was thinking about is like, okay, this, when you think about the model this way, it seems like it's limited to the to the, the, the length of the sequence. If you're if you're relying on dendritic segments in, in sequence, uh, I don't know if you just addressed that through comment because I didn't understand it. Um, but is that a limitation here or not? Uh, I, I would see I would see it as a strength because it's possible to become selective to a sequence that is a bit longer. So I mean, uh, like the main sequences can last, you know, very very long. If you think about a melody, um, predicting the next element in the melody, it, it can be quite quite long, or or a motor sequence, um, like like a yeah. uh, very complex motor sequence you might perform. So one of, when we when we thought about this problem, we always asked, we said to ourselves, well, it, there has to be almost unlimited length of sequences. Um, because they've been quite long, and I just want to understand is is by assuming this dendritic properties, we are you saying that the sequences are limited, or is there some way of getting around that? Uh, I mean, I would certainly say the the single neuron is not going to detect the full sequence on the order of like a, uh, half an hour uh, song that you're listening to, right? Or so even so even it's, even, a, yeah. even a twenty second song. So the question yeah. is the question is do you have a is there, are you going to explain how that happens or is it just sort of a, uh, I, I'm just curious as to where, if, if you see that as a limitation here or not. I would say that that happens on the population level, like you connect neurons together so you can, out of small sequences, you can build longer sequences. I think that is the general principle that you always have to do, but on the small scale, so here we are talking, if you think if you think about this, like it's a very simplistic view uh, here, but if you think about like each segment has a time window of 100 milliseconds and you, you stack a chain of like three, five, six, whatever of these together, you could get up to 600 milliseconds in principle, but the same sequence could also happen in 10 milliseconds. And, and I think this is the interesting mechanism, like that it's the, the timing is a very, um, it's a very flexible thing. This, this sort of mechanism would only care about the order in which these events occurred. And it's not, um, I mean, this will not address the, the sequences on a much longer time scale of seconds, but you could build these sequences from a lot of um, interconnected neurons, each of which does it on a small time scale. Mm 
Uh, are you going to are you going to discuss that later, or is that the future work? Um, I think this is so. What we will discuss now is um, more on the small scale, like single neuron scale. Okay. So we will not okay. get much to this longer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But there is an interesting uh, thing about plateau potentials. I'm sure you're also aware that they can be prolonged. At least there's some evidence for it um, that repeated activations can keep um, dendritic segments uh, active. But still, that doesn't get us to the long sequences. Yeah. Um, I think I'll take over now, Jonas. Correct. Uh, yep. You can take over. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> okay, you, you, you just have to. Yeah. Well, you need to use this creative pause for scale. <laughs> yeah, but I, I actually can't share my screen as long as you have your screen shared. So. Oh, okay. I was not yeah. aware. Okay, sorry. I thought you <laughs> can just steal the screen share. So this should, this should work right now. Wait, give me a second. Okay. Um, so now to sort of the, the, the meat of our model here. And indeed, we did not uh, concentrate as much yet on uh, networks and longer sequences, et cetera. But um, we really drilled down onto, into this um, sort of what you can do with dendritic trees if the thing you're working with is um, compartmentalized dendritic segments um, that interact with each other on sort of a plateau time scale. Um, and for that, let's just imagine a slightly more complicated neuron, right? So we now have um, three um, more distal branches here. And let's go through a quick sequence to see what happens. Um, and our assumption, um, so A would activate segment A, B would activate segment B, and so on. All these three um, segments, the plateaus on which wouldn't interact that much, but they, what they would do is um, they would elevate the voltage in C and make it more likely that C also emits a uh, plateau. And for the purposes of this presentation, we will always assume strict gating, which is of course too strong, right? A very heavy synaptic, spy, uh, uh, um, uh, synaptic input at C would activate a plateau no matter what. But with elevated uh, voltage, um, NMDA spikes are more likely, or NMDA channels are more likely to displace magnesium blocks and initiate plateaus. So, in, in this case, the next element in the sequence would be E, which would be connected to the SOMA um, segment here, and nothing would happen. Um, and in a short uh, second sequence, A, C, E, this would actually be um, recognized because A is sufficient to depolarize C enough. We don't need B and D and then C would activate E and so on. And we have sort of the sequential overlapping of plateaus. And what, this, uh, what we can do with this is we can have our little sort of um, uh, steal a little bit from, from logic uh, in, in, in our notation and say what this neuron in this way would do. It would recognize the sequence A or B or D and then C and then E, right? Um, and the sort of key first functionality here is that you sort of rank order by overlapping the plateaus, you rank order your inputs. You ignore the specific timings and you get the uh, inputs in the correct sequence as it fits to your dendritic tree. The next step of complication we can do is we can introduce inhibitory synapses into the mix. So for the second experiment on this slide, let's introduce an inhibitory synapse to segment C. Um, inhibitory synapses um, can prevent plateaus or disable them at least for a certain amount of time. Um, so the sort of interaction you would have then is you would get A, C, but then the in inhibitory input I would uh, sort of veto the computation that has happened so far. And then E wouldn't actually lead to an output of the neuron. The thing just stops right there. So with inhibitory spikes, you can always on subtrees um, veto the computation that this part of the subtree has done. Um, Lastly, the, the big structural thing we can do with uh, play, playing around with this model is we can just move the segments a little bit. So now say we have two segments connected to the soma. Let's imagine one's the basal segment, one's the trunk towards the apical uh, dendrite, and then we have two segments in the apical part of the dendritic tree, for example. Um, and in this case, we again go through the same sequence, A, B, nothing much happens, C doesn't get any input. But when D gets input and activates a plateau, it's directly connected to the SOMA, which is why in this case, at uh, this symbol E would actually be accepted and we would get an output. And the same, uh, and for 
the second sequence A, C, E, nothing much would change. Still, this dendritic tree computes a different function over these ordered inputs now. And we sort of have, have to represent this in our little formula. So in this case, we would say this uh, dendritic tree corresponds to a sequence that is sort of A or B and then C, or on the other part of the dendrite, um, D. And after all that, I need um, input at the SOMA. And you can uh, start playing around with this and sort of um, depending on how you uh, arrange these types of segments in the dendritic tree, we can get different kinds of computational functions over symbols almost, um, which we thought quite is uh, sort of quite an interesting property, harkens back to the much older days of uh, theoretical neuroscience. And uh, the one thing yeah, we didn't talk- Mm -hmm. to jump in here to, to relate this to the point that Jeff made before. So maybe at this point you, you can then see why, why I was saying that I think actually having this dependency um, might make it more powerful because in this sort of structure, the fact that each dendrite, each dendrite segment would depend on the activity of the upstream dendrite segments it's connected to would allow us to make these a bit more complex expressions. I mean, this neuron might be a bit weird. It's, it's a toy example here. But uh, if by contrast, you assume that each um, dendrite segment that can generate an active event will automatically depolarize the neuron, then the only sort of expression you can build is an A or B or C and then the SOMA. Well, yeah, but, but you know, if you're familiar with our work, then you can see how at the population level that that's not an issue. But we can get back to that later. But it, so this is flexible, but then you have to introduce your inhibitory neuron to basically make this so it's not a general computational element, but it's a sequence memory of a specific sequences, because again, here A and B are equivalent. Um, so you're going to talk more about the inhibitory neurons and how they decide when to become active? Um, uh, not so much, no. no. We are um, going to switch over to stochastic synapses, which are sort of the next key ingredient in our model. But, but all right, so just to make sure I understand this correctly, yeah. it, even here with this model, yeah. with this neuron as you've shown here, it yeah. can't really distinguish between A occurring before B or B occurring before A. Is that right? No, exactly. For this, uh, for this to be the case, you'd have to align them sequentially. And then it could. But, but, right? but, but, but it can't, how would it know A before B or B before A? And this specific one wouldn't. Okay. But if all I right. would, uh, for example, if I would move this dendritic segment. Yeah, I got it. You can move that here. to that. Yes, yes, I see right. that. Yeah. So there's sort of a direct correspondence. And if you know what yeah. kind of sequence you want to store and react to, yeah. you get the tree for it. Yeah. So, so okay, here, if C, if C came first and then A or B, it wouldn't work. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You, so you, you'd want a specific. Um, but again, to, yeah. get the speci to get the specific sequence, you'd have to basically concatenate the, the different dendrites in order. Um, there is a, a fairly strict limit on the branching structure of dendritic trees. Yes. They don't go very deep. Yes. So um, again, limits what an individual neuron could learn in, in any possibility. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. I think this is, this is one of the limitations that we were also wondering about. In, in that sort of model, you get more, um, more refinement on the uh, top Part, like because it's a branching structure, it gets wider towards the top. So you have more segments that are further apart. And that's, so it's easier to initiate a sequence with a lot of different symbols. But as you move towards the SOMA, it, would, it becomes more and more uh, restrictive. So for example, here, the sequence here, it has to end with a C, E, or D, E, yeah. basically. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, so the way, we, the way we dealt with this, we assumed that there was a, a neural population that represented each, each element. And, um, and it was a sparse activation of a neural population. So there was a, essentially a, neurons could participate in many, many different um, uh, elements. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore they could participate in many different places and sequences. So it got around that limitation. Essentially, if you have a population code, you have an unlimited um, representational space, um, effectively unlimited. So, but I, I think I understand, at least I understand what you're, what you're presenting here so far. Now, yep. There's some sort of a population implicit here yeah, we will get to this actually in the next step, okay. uh, because the thing that we obviously haven't talked about at all is where do these symbols A, B, et cetera, right. come from and how are plateaus generated? Um, my, I mean, the, for the specific initia uh, initiation of plateau potentials, the, 
uh, biology is relatively clear. You require depolarization and you require glutamate binding to NMDA receptors. They open up, the cascade of channels opens up and you get the plateau potential. Um, uh, but the, the one key ingredient that we would want to, wait, give me a second here. I'm on the wrong screen. That we had sort of wanted to add here is that um, let's look specifically at how plateaus would be generated for one specific segment. Uh, and the thing that we have included in our model is that all our synapses are stochastic. Uh, that's pretty well documented that this is just, a, it's just the case. Pre-synaptic um, transmitter release is uh, stochastic and quantile. Um, and whenever a, uh, an afferent sort of an input neuron spikes, the segment on which it projects, the, the bit of dendrite on which it projects doesn't always see that spike. Right, uh, so you have sort of this interaction of um, what we require for a plateau to be initiated is a bunch of our input neurons have to spike, and then a sufficient number of those have to be transmitted. Um, and then this little picture here, for example, we just for uh, simplicity, we reduce the numbers here. So there would be an input population with five spikes emitted in a short time interval so that the EPSPs can overlap and the plateau potential could be generated. Two are actually not transmitted just because happenstance, but this would still be in, uh, larger than our threshold, so a plateau would be initiated. Whereas in the second case, there are three uh, um, neurons active in our input populations, which would suffice to emit a plateau, uh, to start a, uh, initiate a plateau potential. But again, one is not transmitted, which means that actually no plateau potential is generated. Uh, and you can uh, describe this relation by a uh, binomial probability distribution. This is just uh, and it's just the number of spikes that are actually sent out by the input population. Then you have the parameter P for the transmission probability. And then you get how many, um, how many spikes are actually transmitted. And then the probability of being above the threshold is just one minus being below the threshold, which you can represent as a CDF. And so first of all, this seems kind of bad. You kind of want to react to uh, with a plateau potential in theory, but what this gives you is um, the probability of responding to a plateau potential uh, is directly proportional to how large the input volley is. The if you receive twenty spikes, you're much more likely to initiate a plateau versus you receiving ten spikes, etc. And you sort of have this hidden um, uh, hidden continuous variable in there, right? And then we can apply that to our plateaus as uh, to our dendritic trees as well. So the um, are you are you taking is this a a property? I mean, you could argue the same would occur even if uh, um, synapses were not stochastic. You could just say, oh, I'm re I have so many axons that are coming in, and if they all a certain number of them send a spike that gets transmitted, then then we reach our plateau. Uh, so, uh, so it, are you showing just how this will work if with stochastic synapses or somehow stochastic synapses playing an essential role? Both. Um, so I hope it will become more clear throughout this uh, slide. And then this is sort of okay. our sort of stepping stone to go towards network model, which is slightly different to the way you took, um, which is to get to really to temporal codes uh, and the HDM models. Um, here it turns out that you can actually sort of benefit from this property to um, to get a really quite nicely sampled sort of, uh, let me get through the slide and then maybe it'll get more clear. Okay. And otherwise we can talk about it afterwards again. Um, so you combine these relatively simple. Um, we decided that um, either of these two segments emitting a plateau would be enough for the, for us to consider uh, this uh, little subtree here to, to emit a plateau, right? So it's P of A or B, and we have our little logic again. Um, and then for sequential segments, now we actually have to get rid of the um, temporal component um, to be able to analyze it in any way. So what we're already assuming here that we know that there's a volley with size N1 arriving at B, and that's within one plateau interval and before A, which would then get a number N2, for example, of input volleys. And then the probability of uh, this dendritic tree emitting a plateau is just the probability of those two successful threshold crossings. And you can continue to play this game in a more complicated tree as well. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is just a bit of uh, pushing, pushing letters around. Um, 
the fact is that you can and you can replace as well the uh, these little p of a or b's or this p of uh, a and b's with um, inserting all these little probability distributions of threshold crossing and then you get these uh, well-known formulas for um, sort of or events and end events and you can apply this recursively and get a really sort of monster of a formula out for this one that is not really it's not fantastic that you get a long formula out for this one the cool thing is that um, the expected value of the entire neuron responding as a sort of the key message here um, is proportional to each of the individual segments crossing a threshold given a bunch of uh, volley events and the probability of each of the neurons crossing a threshold is directly proportional to input volley sizes. Uh, so one, the, one, uh, quick question. Yeah. It, it seems to me like if you're dealing with sequences, yes, uh, you can't assume independence between these A's and B's, right? That's sort of the in, inherent in what a definition of a sequence is. So for, for this thing to work, what you have to do is you have to have observed events in, in the language of graphical model, models. And then you get the independence and you can do this bit. And sort of um, that's sort of the first part of what uh, this type of den the segmentic dendritic tree would give you is it actually gives you sort of the rank ordering. And then if you wanted to analyze a particular input sequence of, um, of volleys, you could um, split the problem and first compute what the rank ordering sort of do I have, when are my volley events? Are they in the correct sequence and within the correct time frames? And if I have that, I can do this independent analysis over here. So if you want to do both at the same time, you sort of get into a, it's, it's really difficult to analyze probabilistic. Yeah, that, that's the issue. Yeah, that's the situation we ran into a few, <laughs> 10 years ago, whatever, trying to do this in a Bayesian way. Yeah. Gets, the math gets super hairy, but at the same yes. time, I'm not sure you can assume independence either. Um, no, I think I think the point here here would be that uh, you can you can say what's the probability of the neuron to respond to a given sequence A C E for example assuming the sequence is there right Th then you can say okay that's the probability that the first segment will respond to the first um, uh, signal A and the second will respond to the second signal and so on and so so then the question is like why would you want the detector to not detect it if it was there and I think and this is the idea um, that uh, a deterministic detector will always respond the same way to the same sequence, right? So if the sequence is now um, very weak, like very small volleys of spikes, like a very weak indication that this event A has happened, the detector will either detect it or it won't. And if you add a lot of these detectors and they are tuned in a similar way, they will all respond or none of them will respond. But if you include, uh, include this um, probabilistic transmission, you could get into a situation where an ensemble of a couple of these neurons will have a graded response um, because like they each of them independently will with some probability transmit and then so you can infer like if an, um, if you have a couple of neurons that are looking for the same uh, sequence and uh, half of them uh, got activated then uh, it's an indicator that there is like stronger evidence for a sequence than if only a quarter of them turned on yeah right so, so that's that's sort of the key takeaway. You can you sort of inherit from the that the individual segment turns on proportional to the size of the input volley, which you can regard as evidence, given that you know all the input volleys and they are in the correct order. Um, you sort of uh, inherit that proportionality for the entire neuron, and you get sort of an expected response probability, which you can read out in a in an actual ensemble, which is sort of our way to sort of ease into neural networks with these kinds of neural models. Okay, um, I think, yeah, that's basically it. Um, we sort of try to simplify our, our, our modeling approach and sort of the key messages to, to take away is that we think if, at least if you believe in that the um, segmented dendrites are possible in this way where they interact with plateau potentials in a relatively localized way, you get these, um, you can get these intricate expressions out um, that represent what the neuron computes um, based on the structure of the dendrite and where the synapses are placed. And then you can evaluate the entire expression probabilistically um, by regarding um, sort of by just introducing stochastic synapses and doing a relatively crude, simple analysis, um, which we thought is a really nice property. Um, there are clearly a 
lot of open questions. Networks was just, uh, Johannes just mentioned it already. Um, you can get the expected value of individual neurons read out in an ensemble if you just have many of them, because there is no reason to assume that um, stochastic synapses are in any way dependent on each other on different neurons. So that would be an independent sample sort of of the same probability distribution. But then the next question is, uh, from all of these get a, going to a neural upstate or whatever, uh, with the same probability, how do you read that bit out, right? Uh, and uh, what you have to do is, in order to stay within our modeling framework at least, is you have to re, um, reproduce a volley that then is, for example, uh, if, the, um, if each of the neurons has a response probability of 0.3 or so, that three out of 10 neurons sw uh, switch on and send out a volley, which could then be read out by a neuron down the line. Right? And there's some work in, in our group as well as in, in others, really historical hippocampus work, where how that deal with how typically point neurons can deal with coordinating with each other to generate these kinds of volleys. Uh, the next question is one that uh, Jeff also alluded at. Um, the complexity you, you can expect with these kinds of uh, interactions in the dendritic tree is limited, but what's the correct level? Uh, how much detail should you actually model um, when talking about single neurons, especially because uh, I'm sure uh, researchers that work a lot on biological neurons and measure the intricate dynamics that can happen between two uh, different branches of the dendrite when you disturb them in different orders and stuff like that with reflecting voltages. There's much more detail in theory to be had. At what point do you make the cut? And at what point do you go from this is done on a neuron level to this is done on a network level? We don't have a super clear question uh, answer to that question yet, just intuitions. Um, and then the other very big topic that we left out completely today is how do you learn um, these networks? Uh, I think this also touches on the inhibitory synapse uh, because learning that is actually, a, a, if, if you wanted to learn it in the context of the types of models we've talked about, is actually presumably quite difficult. How would you know when you have to switch something off, basically? Um, but the easier problems we already inherit is that uh, there's good evidence from this Boston group that uh, at least LTP, so potentiation of synaptic weights, is really incredibly local if you deal with active dendrites, i.e. there, even if you take the backpropagating action potential out, which is in theory meant to um, enable the synapse to learn something about what the soma actually emits in the end, doesn't seem to be that important. It's really the local process that determines plasticity. Um, and you don't know much about what's going on uh, in the rest of the dendritic tree or at the soma, which if you have a model with uh, branching uh, dendritic segments uh, in a tree, uh, that's sort of a problem. They have to still work together, even if they don't know of each other. Um, then transmission probabilities are also a hot topic of uh, debate in both the world of plasticity um, and in our view, you'd sort of have to balance the activation probability of plateaus correctly, uh, because segment C, for example, in our earlier model, would be able to block all activity uh, arriving at the SOMA, so if the probability at segment C to generate a plateau is too low, nothing will ever happen, that's bad. And in the same way, if it just goes active all the time, probably also a bad idea. So we expect there to be a homeostatic mechanism that can balance the uh, regularity with which plateaus are generate, uh, generated, and we expect it to be related to both uh, synaptic weights as well as um, transmission probabilities. And lastly, and this is very clear, I think, from, uh, from our presentations, that we rely incredibly on where synapses are placed in the dendritic tree versus what the particular weight of one individual synapse is. Um, this clearly implicates structural plasticity, so the question of where a synapse should be there's lots of evidence that this happens in the brain in many different ways. Um, but we'd really kind of have to introduce that into our model and we can't rely on any gradient uh, descent type, um, full backprop uh, rules or anything like that, I think, in, in this case. And this is really the type of plasticity that would have the greatest impact on um, the types of functions we can learn efficiently. Right, so uh, that's... I would like to conclude with sort of our grand hypothesis um, uh, that we'd argue that neurons with active and segmented dendrites 
would detect sequentially ordered inputs, but they do so with timing invariance. They represent events as synchronous spike volleys that are transmitted with a certain probability. And the structure of the dendritic tree determines the complex structured expression, which is evaluated then probabilistically um, proportional to the size of, of the volleys arriving at each of the segments. Um, yeah, and with that, uh, that's sort of the main part of our um, presentation. There's some more information here. We have uh, the fourth version of our preprint here. It turns out to be not very easy to publish. Um, as well as a paper at the NICE workshop and two presentations Johannes and I gave at uh, uh, other opportunities if you're interested in more information. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Yay, very nice. Have you seen, uh, I guess one question, have you seen uh, experimental evidence um, that's, uh, let me ask, what is the closest experimental evidence you've seen that might uh, support your model? I know there's a lot of background uh, citations you gave, but is there, are there specific experiments you've seen or would like to see that would help? Uh... But the, the, ex the experiment that I can't recall from the top of, so I don't think we, we, I would remember it if, it if we found it before, is, is really we would, what we'd really need is that these sort of localized interaction um, really does happen. There is a Klopath paper from, I think, uh, 20, 15, 14, or something like that, which is a computational model in the basal dendrite, um, where they measured, they were interested much more in the plasticity, but they were interested in active NMDA events because that also drives plasticity. Uh, that at least gave some hints that um, this types of elevated voltage makes it more likely that the plateau is generated down the line, etc., cetera, um, might have some merit. Uh, they, for example, quantify the number of the size of the synchronous volley you need the closer you get to the soma um, to initiate a plateau, and this just keeps on rising, which is due to the uh, width of the um, dendrite, presumably, to the impedance properties. Um, there's this fantastic eLife paper that I will also um, look up quickly and send to you uh, in terms of this compartmentalization of um, sort of electric coupling around the dendrite, which uh, comes up with dendritic trees that uh, sort of segmentation of dendritic trees that are roughly in the complexity area that we've shown today. Um, some more complicated, some much simpler. Um, yeah, so um, the, 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 this NMDA, a decade of the NMDA spike paper actually has almost the, the graphic, I think if I, if I just uh, like, almost this thing at the very, very end of the, of the paper. So they hypothesize this already, right? So as, a, as an idea, this is not fundamentally new. There's literally, uh, they, I think they have it on one axis and it's a plateau, 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 right? Um, uh, this is what they, what they end their paper with. So it sort of skirts it all the time. It's no direct evidence. It's, it's just sort of indicators that we think this might be, might be what's going on. And a lot of the experiments are done in indirect ways because, of course, the experimenters were not trying to verify or falsify this model, right? They are often trying to test completely different hypotheses, and so you have very indirect evidence. And I think what we would really need is someone to check if they can um, if they can find a dendrite, like if they can identify dendrite segments, stimulate these dendrite segments ideally through really synaptic inputs, not through some other like depolarizing the dendrite directly or some glutamate uncaging or something, but like really synaptic inputs to one dendrite segment, synaptic inputs to a different dendrite segment a bit further downstream, and then synaptic input to one even further downstream. And to then really tease apart, so what happens if we only send a burst of spot like a volley of spikes to the um, to the most uh, distant dendrite segment, to the one a bit closer to the one um, at the soma, versus we only stimulate the one far apart or we only stimulate the one in the middle and really just go through all of these different permutations and excluding a lot of these other distracting factors that might also be in there. That I, I haven't seen. I mean, there's um, the one thing that might be closest to verifying this type of sequence detection along the dendrite with active um, uh, dendrites, but it's not a plateau measurement. Is uh, I think Branko and Häuser, I think, um, basically measured that you 
can on a relatively fast time scale with active dendrites get this preferential sequ uh, sequential activation along a dendritic cable. Right? You can get ABC and you have a much higher likelihood of a response if you uh, activate in that order. I think, yeah, but I think that was all within a segment, if I remember correctly. It wasn't sort of across segments like yeah. this. They, they it's sort of, it's a, sort of a stretch stretch of cable, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's slightly different, I think, than this. Yep. Yeah, but uh, um, I mean, some of the citations you, you, you might have seen is like, this is extremely new work and experimenters are getting super inventive. Um, so this, uh, this, uh, this group that, were imag that is now in vivo imaging. So first of all, it seems to me that many of these studies that come up with, oh, there's, there's actually a lot of active dendrites going on in the brain are in vivo studies and they don't seem to often occur in in vitro as much. So you can, of course, generate them, but you have no idea how frequent they are because you don't know what the input statistics are exactly. And that's, of course, really, really hard to test. So um, um, I think Meta, uh, the, that study is like, it, it measured the frequency of dendritic spikes versus somatic spike, but it's really about a new technique of measuring dendritic voltages. Yeah, yeah. This right? is the and that's 2017. Yeah, that's the Mayank Meta. Um, yeah. From what I understand, that uh, that technique is pretty controversial. Um, and and right. uh, there's still more work to be done on, on there, I think. I'm but sure. it would be great. I mean, we, we would love to see yeah. the, the overall idea that there are a lot of these active dendritic spikes. Yeah. Uh, but if, um, it's, you know, and being it, it, it being far greater than the number of action potential, somatic action potential, I, I think, is very much consistent with our, our theories. Let me just quickly, I, I think this, this is one fantastic um, paper that I, I think would be really interesting in, in this regard, which is um, uh, two photo microscopy uh, in vivo, re resolving, I think, like 300 micrometers of dendrite, including the soma. And they have these little localized calcium events in there. Mm. So, really, I, I have no idea how to do that, of course, <laughs> even the slightest. It's really impressive. It's, um, but as a theoretician, it's very difficult. I mean, you probably went through the same phase too, right? And it's, it's very difficult to navigate the biological evidence out there because sometimes you also, for, for every phenomenon you find, there's also like a, the direct a contradiction of the two. Yeah, yeah. So the, 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 my general rule is, you know, you have to, you have to read at least uh, half a dozen papers to, to start making a judgment of what's right or wrong because they are contradictory at times, or they use different experimental techniques, or they use different animals or different preparations of animals and so on. It's very difficult. Um, I have a couple of questions. I, I'll let you finish. I don't want to interrupt what you're doing here, but. Hmm. No, I was just like, these are these sort of measurements of you can sort of see the calcium concentrations along dendritic segments there. Hmm. They, they, they can be localized, but they also sometimes are not. Um, maybe this is also where, why, why, we had, why we had this disagreement at the beginning of our talk. Um, are these, are these uh, uh, basal dendrites or are these apical dendrites? That's actually a good question. Um, apical trunk. Yeah. Yeah, I can yeah. send it. Yeah, so, so I, you know, I think we'd agree with you on the on the apical dendrites. The calcium yeah. um, plays a big role. I, I, if I can ask a couple of questions, yes, um, sure. I'll just state them both. They're very different questions. And one is uh, one of the problems that we really focused on our models is just is about the timing issues, because as you so to point out, sometimes you can you want timing invariance, um, but other times uh, we clearly are not timing invariant. If you think about a melody the intervals between the in individual elements of the melody is, are very important. And that's true of certain movements as well, like, you know, learned movements. Um, and so, and then you also have to be ability to speed things up and slow them down, both for playback and inference. Um, and so you have to have a, a, some sort of a knowledge about that. So I just didn't know much. Have you thought about, don't answer this yet, but have you thought about um, the, the, the issue of how you would encode specific timings and how you would be able to speed them up and slow them down? Um, in addition to the invariants that you mentioned. And then the second question is a broader question, which is like, well, I don't know how familiar you are with our HCM sequence memory, but I'd love to hear your criticism of it. I'd like to know what you think, uh, what parts do you think that you didn't 
that you didn't like or didn't believe or things you think we left out of it, um, that would be helpful for me too. Okay, um, so I think you're touching on, on on a very interesting point there with the timing. Um, during some part of our sort of research journey on, on this topic, um, we really thought about like, this is such a simple model. We, what we, I mean, Johannes is at the Integrated Circuits Institute. Now that's not coincidence. We're interested in building this type of designing hardware for this type of algorithm as well. But then you immediately go into applications and in applications, it will always, it will sometimes be relevant the timing and sometimes it won't be. How do you get it back if, it, if, if you lost it? Um, so within the scope of this model, I think it's interesting that not all dendritic events are plateaus. There are also spikes, um, natrium spikes or, or whatever, sodium spikes rather. Um, and those might be much more suited to solving these types of problem. Our, sort of our takeaway from this is that the diversity of neurons is probably not an accident. So our intuition, I, I think I'm speaking for both of us is that you might want a different solution for that type of problem, right? If, if, if timing is really, if precise timing is really important, you might need some other ingredients on top of the mix, sort of, right? You, just the point neuron seems, by now at least from a neuroscience perspective, seems a little, I'm not sure where you're, where you're going to end up. You have to, re, have to rely on the network to do everything. I don't think that's completely correct. But when you change the neuron, I don't think there's a one neuron model to rule them all. all. Um, that's sort of my takeaway here. I think plateaus can be very valuable computationally. You can do lots of interesting stuff. Um, you can do a little bit more theory on these little um, expressions that we presented. Um, and it sort of gives you really an insight of how computation might come about in this way, but you lose the timing and sometimes you want it. And it might be that you just need a different tool for that. Um, the, the one thing I would add is that um, when we are talking about emitting synchronous volleys is, uh, I mean, the hippocampus people also have this debate all the time, whether um, the sort of coordinated output of spikes, which are also well-timed, right? And they pre-process and post-process spikes and they have all this intricate um, variations in the timing. In the end, they encode order, but they have to change the timings. And they have this debate about rhythm makers or internally generated rhythms. And I think with those kinds of model, our model is still compatible because you can, for example, if you have an external uh, rhythm clock, if that would exist, which I don't think it does, but in theory, you can, of course, have neurons in upstates and then just go um, basically query them, right? Um, send a spike, see if a spike comes out, and then you get um, your nicely timed outputs. Um, so a really interesting topic. Yep. Yeah, there are also like different dirty tricks one could play. We, we were thinking about it, like, the, for example, inhibition might be on a different time scale, and then you could potentially also trigger some uh, rebound spikes by basically like inhibiting a plateau for some time, and then the activity comes back. And this way you could like delay something and make precise delays. You could build weird clock circuits that generate these pulses, and then you detect the specific sequences of clock pulses. And so, but this is more like esoteric stuff, and we didn't want to go into this direction like first think about the basic principles but um yes or the we, we focused more on the detection of sequences the generation of sequences is a bit more difficult and i think this is where you then need to think about transmission delays um we have completely ignored the um, temporal the, the passive dynamics of the dendrite right we only talked about like coincidence spikes trigger an event thing goes on but of course it doesn't happen instantaneously. There, there are some, like there's still the passive integration and maybe the passive integration, like this exponential kernels, they are really useful for the precise timing. Maybe it's recurrent population activity. Um, hard to say, yeah. And, and um, maybe re relating the second question, so you're asking for a comparison to the HTM model. Um, I think so. Uh, I, I like the HTM model. I think it's very nice. And I think it's it's in broad strokes, it is very compatible to this. I think the difference is, I mean, I'm, you have to correct me if I'm misrepresenting the, the model, but um, for, for us, the HTM model was not, I, I think we didn't perceive it as an, as an attempt of a, um, like a biological model that explains the direct mechanism, but it's like also you have the time step operation. Um, you have some simplifying assumptions in there, which I think are very elegant, like the, that the dendrite is um, the sort of pattern detector and you have the different branches for detecting different patterns and so on. This is 
similar, I think we were interested in really like this, these local mechanisms. Um, so how, how is the plateau generated? How is the interaction between neighboring branches and the complexity that that brings? And so I think for us, we were just interested on like what happens on the, on the real time axis and in these complex branch structures. Um, I think if we go in the direction, as Pascal mentioned, and you, you want to actually build something in hardware, then all of this complexity is very uh, unpleasant. And you, you, if you, as soon as you start thinking about hmm, how can we break down the neuron, like this complex neuron that we're showing here, like a tree like this, how can you break it down? I think you will find, um, you, you probably can just replicate, replicate this by building a tree-like structure out of a lot of HDM neurons, I, I think. We didn't actually try that, but I would believe it should be possible. Thank you, so, that's very helpful. That's very helpful, but um, I guess I would, I would characterize it a little bit differently. I, I mean, our goal is to be a very biologically accurate model. Um, so we don't want to introduce anything in which we think violates biology. Maybe that I think the key difference is, is that we, we brought up earlier we felt that the dendritic spike was the, the key element here, um, and not and 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 so we based our models around that, and we we kind of ignored the uh, sequential activation along dendrite, which was some evidence for that too. Um, uh, so we focused on the dendritic spike element, uh, which we believe is very well uh, documented in the neuroscience literature, um, and, and you focused on a different element of dendrites. Um, I just, but I don't, at least, I don't know if we achieved it, but our goal is definitely to not be, it was to be very biologically accurate. The, the HTML model in our mind is, is we're pr proposing that how actual real neurons do this. Um, but I can see that how we end up at different places, but, but I appreciate that um, feedback. That's very helpful. Yeah, I, it feels to me like we, um, we definitely, I, I'm not sure how, I, I can't presume it. I, for, for us, it was very. It is still quite difficult um, to publish all all this all this stuff. Even though um, we did have very good feedback uh, along the way, um, but if you get uh, like we had nice reviews as well, but we also frequently had very not very nice reviews. So I think we are at least on the same sort of side of history that there's a little bit more to the dendrite than uh, sort of passive integrator, and that that is important for the theory. Um, one sort of very nice thing, uh, the first time I encountered the HTM model was actually in a hackathon where a group of students, uh, which we did together with the, I guess the German equivalent of the CDC, uh, and one group of students decided to use your, the Python packages um, that you provide. Uh, and I think the, uh, the, the outlier detection or the sort of anom anomaly detection thing. And I was extremely successful in uh, analyzing uh, flu data. Uh, they had the best results. Uh, so that was really, really nice. That was our first contact point. The one thing, and I, I would like to ask you about this, if, if I get this wrong or if, if, um, if I have misunderstood something or if this is actually the case in the HTM model right now as it relates to biology. Um, when you get your sequential codes, out of um, sort of, I think there's a, the, these nice little pictures where you re get really nice sequential codes because the sequence of activation simply changes the activation, right? At, at this time point, you sort of have embedded in a very particular way, the history, right? So the sequence led that, that to this point and that I thought was very elegant. The one thing that tripped me up and which I'm not super sure about is that it seemed to rely sometimes on like very particular, this thing has to spike and trigger this, right? So a very state automata like almost mechanism on the level of neurons transmitting spikes to other neurons. And that was the thing that felt a little bit, I'm not super sure if I got this right. Um, I mean, <laughs> We, we can't throw stones here. We don't even have a network model, um, but, uh, <laughs> but and we also but, drew automata, right? So and we also drew automata <laughs> on top of so that. Need to be careful. But, <laughs> but, but what but, else could it be? What else could it be if it's not neurons sending spikes to other neurons? What else? Exactly. So, so I guess my question I'm not, is: I'm not sure I understand the question. Actually, do do, do you think uh, the HCM model straightforwardly would just work with? Uh, the way we've presented it here is sort of a sort of so an ensemble that sends a bunch of spikes that are probabilistically transmitted, and that's the signal. Right? Well, I think it's a probabilistic case, transmission thing is like it. It, uh, it seems it, to be it, extremely. 
Well, I think in our case, we assume this, uh, there's always um, a distribution, right? Nothing is represented by a single neuron ever. And so it's always a distribution. The distributions are quite unique and they can be quite noisy. So if I'm saying, oh, this 2%, if I have a population of 5,000 neurons and let's say uh, 100 are active at any point in time, well, and I'm, I need to detect 20 of those to, to reliably detect the pattern. Well, then you can have a lot of noise. You could, you could have 40 synapses and a lot of noise and a lot of, um, it, it's, not a, it's not a property of the system. We're not relying on it, but it's also one that it's very, very um, tolerant to that kind of uh, dropout noise, neurons dying, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, so it's, but it, that's what gets to my question earlier because we don't rely on it as a computational principle, but we rely on it as a constraint that says, yeah, the system has to be extremely robust to all these different types of um, uh, probabilistic influences or just, mm -hmm. you know, noise type influences. So I'm not sure if that gets at your question there. Uh, I just thought, uh, it actually does. In the 2016 paper, I think we, we modeled uh, a lot of failure in the, in the neurons and the representation and showed that something like 40 or 50% noise would work just fine. Okay, I, th I think I got, uh... The, the uh, pictures were very nice with the with the dots. Well, the pictures, the pictures just right? show. You know, obviously, we can, when <laughs> yeah. you draw those pictures, yeah. and and I, I mean, we do those, the same thing. <laughs> you know, I, I drew a lot of those pictures. You know, you can't show a population of yeah. five thousand neurons. You can't show you know forty synapses per segment. You know, um, and so you make these very uh, simple drawings. We show three active neurons and three active synapses, or whatever it was. Mm. But of course, I think in the body of that paper, and I think especially in the 2016 paper, Subutai did a nice little write-up about the mathematics of this. There's a yeah. box a table on that. And um, so, you know, trying to get people to say, no, it's like these big populations are doing all these things. But, but yeah. it's really helpful. Yeah, and that's something you could leverage as well. I think, um, you know, basically what the mathematics says, if you have a very high dimensional input, but you're only sampling from it. You, you, so the dendritic segment only has 20 or 30 synapses from a much higher dimensional population. You can get these sort of robustness properties. Uh, and that's something you can easily incorporate in your model as well. You know, as long as the underlying presynaptic population is large enough, and yeah. but the dendritic segment is just a small subset of that. Um, yeah. And picking up on patterns, you automatically get a lot of these properties. I think that's yep. especially true when if you start thinking about networks um, yeah. and uh, building networks a lot, a lot of these neurons in, in some sense, yeah. Yeah, which I think is sort of implicit in your model too, because you, you talk about pattern A, but presumably it's a cluster of synapses that's co-activating within a yes. few milliseconds, you know, yes. just to, to activate a dendritic spike. So you, you, there's an assumption that there is a uh, sparse, but uh, clustered patterns of activity that, that are, that's ongoing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And what's, what's interesting about these models uh, is that if you have this sort of like this gating mechanism where the neuron gets turned into whether you want to call it an upstate or a, like an elevated pl um, memory and potential in the however you want to call it, um, it's easier to generate these synchronized by follies too, right? Because you can, you, exactly. you can prime the neuron and then, yeah. Yeah, so. exactly. It almost has to be that way. I, yeah. I totally agree with you. Yeah, and this stuff often gets missed, I think, by neuroscientists, because uh, if you think computationally, it just has to be that way. Uh, yeah. I'd be interested if we uh, like convinced you even to a slight degree that there might be something useful about stochastic synapses. Because from uh, if you read the literature on it, there's uh, at least for some time, there, is, there was a, a bunch of debate whether plasticity should really change synaptic release probabilities or whether it should change uh, change uh, synaptic weights or efficacies, and, and that implies that there is a computational function, and you do see these nice little. So the um, transmission probabilities are clustered. For example, if if there's a population of a thousand neurons or so, and they all project, um, say a hundred, and they tend to find fire synchronous volleys onto this specific segment, you will find a cluster of uh, spines on which the, um, all the contexts have very similar release probabilities. So, so, but overall in the neuron, the release probabilities are actually um, quite heterogeneous and not homogeneous at all. So they're widely distributed. When you say so there the, seems to be something to it. Um, when you say so re their release probabilities, what, what are you referring to exactly? I mean, I mean, yeah. the, I mean, you know, first of all, as far as I understand, axonal spikes are very reliable. You know, they, yes. they, will, get, they will get to their destination. So we're just talking about uh, releasing of um, 
uh, transmitter at the, at the synaptic cleft. And the, the, the stochastic mix there is largely due with the, the very recent history of the synapse more so. It, it doesn't have vesicles that are waiting to be dispersed as opposed to, I mean, it, it, it's, it, well, I guess maybe the short answer to your question is I, I've never read anything which is convincing to me about the, the, the advantages of, of these, uh, of, of synapses not always releasing uh, vesicles. Um, but it has more, it almost always has to do with, um, uh, you know, basically what is the recent history. Some, some synapses, um, they decrease over time. So if you have a series of spikes in a row, then the release probability goes down and some actually goes up. Um, but, but I've never seen a convincing argument to me that, oh, this is a, that, the, that this, the randomness of them, if there is such a thing, uh, is it really essential? So I think this is a short answer to your question. But um, I've never seen anything convincing myself. I think yeah. we have to look in our reference as well, because I'm pretty sure that we, we looked at a couple of studies that report very different um, transmission probabilities, and they can get quite low, actually, up to the point that like, you could even argue that silent synapses that don't release anything are like transmission probability zero, and then you yeah. might actually have a continuum, right? Yeah, we think, we think actually those are going to be essential in certain in learning situations, because I mean, if you think about synapses, are your basic, your method of learning? Well, you can form new synapses pretty quickly, but pretty quickly is in the matter of, you know, you know, tens of minutes. And that's not fast enough for a lot of the learning we have to do. So silent synapses give you the ability to essentially go from a zero transmission to a, a very a positive transmission uh, in a very quick um, uh, metabolic um, cascade which could, you know, essentially be instant learning or very, very close to instant learning. So, and then, you know, it's interesting, you see a lot of silent synapses in the hippocampus where that's where you need to have very fast learning for certain. I see them elsewhere too, but they're very predominant in the hippocampal neurons, uh, parameter neurons. And um, so, you know, these all fit into the, they're not probabilistic in some sense, they're more like waiting to be turned on in our, in our thinking, <laughs> that's how we think of them. <laughs> Uh, for us, they are the extreme end of the spectrum with probability zero. But I guess, like, yeah, you can interpret it differently. And I don't think there is really, it, yeah, it, it's, I don't think there's that much direct uh, evidence that you could conclusively say this is definitely this is how it works. Like, the, again, there's different arguments we've seen where some people say that the uh, transmission probabilities are very high, but it's in one population of neurons. And the difference it's very, very low. They are, are they homeostatically regulated or not? Um, are they just a chance occurrence? Is just history dependence i've read all of these different accounts and yeah 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 but anyway from a theory point of view i haven't found anything compelling yet i mean and you can look at all this data and you have to just you know as we said earlier you can't just read the data and accept it you have to say okay well there's different ways you're going to interpret this um and some people will say well they're stochastic therefore it must be you know important or you could say well they're not as stochastic as you think they are and and maybe we just have to deal with it. The fact that they're, you know, we're dealing with little biological stuff that isn't always, uh, you know, routine these little things, they're not always reliable. So the system has to work despite that. <laughs> That's the way I always yeah. looked at it. Yeah, yeah for, for us, I think the intuition, I think the only thing that kind of made sense, so for us, it was also like adding noise for, from an engineering point doesn't help normally, right? It makes things worse, adding noise un unnecessarily. With one exception, I think that's this idea of like uh, dithering some input, like you have a fixed threshold and you have a signal. And if you add noise to it, you, you can get out of the deterministic detector, you can get a, um, a quantity, like you can get a graded response out of it, right? By, by changing the probability that a given input will get the deterministic detector to fire because of the noise. Yeah, and, yeah, but it's like it's stretching a bit. Like it, I'm, yeah. I'm not. I wouldn't. And that may it. that may be true too, but that but that's essentially again compensating for perhaps an a, a non ideal world, right? You know. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, these are all interesting ideas. So, um, but um, I I like what you're doing. You know, I've always I I know there's there really is evidence that under certain conditions and certain neurons, the order along the dendrite matters. And uh, we, we don't pay attention to that really. Um, and I've always wondered, you know, is it gonna be, is it important or not? Does it, is it, um, and so it was interesting, it was happy to see you guys thinking about that. Although I do think the shortcomings of that approach uh, that are pretty severe too. So um, anyway, I just appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, thanks.
I think the main points, like if we could get one point across, uh, uh, then we would be happy for the broader neuroscience community. If people at least accepted that uh, we have to stop using point neuron models, we should look at dendritic complexity. Active processes in there are important and Probably this is, I think, our, uh, what, I mean, uh, probably for you the same, actually, like the complexity of the dendrite has a functional meaning. It's not an accident of nature. I think that's also an, yeah. uh, at least a hypothesis. Yeah, I know. And it, it's surprising how people are resistant to that. But then, but, you know, if you look at the problem, one of the problems is that the success of the machine learning community has had using point neurons. And, uh, and then they say, yeah, see, we don't need this stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they're probably right. I mean, right no, now, well, I, mean, I think they're right. It, it, I don't think they're right overall. They're right now for that point because I don't buy that. Um, for the next couple of years. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming. I know it's uh, pretty late for you guys. 